but we're so delighted once again to have Dr. Franco is going to share with us today. Come on, welcome Dr. Franco. And uh, can I brag on you for a few moments? Okay, I'm going to brag on him for a few moments. Dr. Franco grew up in, a very, in the very orphanage that we now are, that he's now running. And he was an orphan. And God got a hold of his life, gave his life to Christ. God called him to be a medical doctor. He went to medical school and traveled around the world. Doctors Without Walls, is that what it's called? Borders, borders Without Walls. Okay, Doctors Without Borders, and he ran around the world, and now he is an inspiration to the orphans to know that, yes, you can be like Dr. Franco. God, get a hold of you, and don't let anyone limit what God can do through a surrendered life. Can you please welcome back once again, Dr. Franco. So, Dr. Franco, actually, give me a hug. Let me give him a hug. There we go. <laughs> So why don't you just go ahead and just quickly uh, tell us what's going on in Haiti right now, in case folks don't realize what's taking place. Um, thank you so much for having me. Right now, it is total chaos in Haiti. And as Pastor Eric has said, uh, even Af Afghanistan is better because at least they have a group of people in charge. In Haiti, there is nothing right now. You don't have to have something against someone to get killed. So the people cannot walk in the street, killing, kidnapping. Um, it is, uh, and as you know, Haiti, 90% uh, of the people have to go on an every day out on the street to eat. So that's how they survive. This is one of the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So when you cannot go out, you cannot eat. So right now it is the, I'm 54 years old. That's the lowest that I have seen during my life. So we need a lot of prayers. We need a lot of support. Uh, we have faith that God will do something. We continue to pray because God's people, including you, myself, and all the saints all over, we are praying for Haiti, and we know that God will raise Haiti back again. You know, at this time, I'd like to be able to do before he begins, can we just, uh, as an act of extension, to, to reach our hands for Dr. Frank, we want to pray for Haiti. We want to pray for Go Haiti. So let's do it right now. Father, we thank you, God, when everything seems like it's hopeless, you're the God in the middle of it all. And Father, we thank you that you love Haiti. And you've connected us to Dr. Franco. Lord, we're asking in Jesus' name that you protect these orphans in the mountains. Not only that, God, but your church throughout the country of Haiti, Lord, that you would empower them. For, Father, the only hope for this country is you. And, Lord, we're asking that you would do an amazing work within your church. Father, that you'd bring out with signs and wonders, healings, and order would take place. We're also praying for a, a government to come in and to bring an end to the chaos. Father, we're asking that you would do an amazing work. Lord, we don't even know how to pray in these situations. But, Lord, we ask you, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and rescue this country in this terrible situation. We pray for Dr. Franco. We pray for Go Haiti. We ask for divine wisdom. We thank you for protecting these children. And we're asking of God that you would provide everything needed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, it is always a privilege and a blessing to be with what I call my extended family here. You are in Jesus, my extended family. So continue to pray for me because despite of what is going on in Haiti, I continue to go once a month. So next month again, I'm going to be there to be with the children. We have 66 of them in the mountain and 25 staff, and uh, sometime... Uh, living Vancouver where I live presently and I give a hug to my wife, we know that there is a fair chance that I may not come back. But when you call them your children and they call you daddy, you cannot abandon them when the time is bad. So that's one of the reasons. And of, of, of course, I have the blessing of my wife and uh, sometime with tears in her eyes praying for me and say that, I send you and I pray for you. We're waiting for you to come back. But let me tell you, God is good and I'm not scared. And I know that uh, whatever he wants to happen will happen. But beside of what he wants, nothing will happen. So I have peace in the midst of the chaos that I will go and I will come back and the perfect will of God will be done. So I would like to show you some pictures of uh, what 
Go Haiti was a few years ago and what it is right now after we had to flee to the mountain. This is when we got the place, it was completely empty. Thanks to your support and your financial support and your physical support. Because Cornerstone did not just send money. They actually go and put their hands. So we were able to, be, to build this guest house. And some more will... And this is the orphanage, and I want you to know, to, I want you to be part of what God has done using you, because that's your money, making this place so beautiful. And uh, we continue to go with the picture that's pearly, and uh, the, wind, uh, the glass windows that you have financed to make the place, because before that, it was an empty shell with no bathroom, nothing, but people like you have helped to put it together. And that's the back of the orphanage. Now, this is where we are in the mountain. It used to be a, a storage for cement. When we flee to the mountain, that's the best place we could have. So we, may, we, we make the best with what we have. And uh, we continue. That's the dorm for the boys. They come from running water. They come from windows. And then to get to this place, that's the best we could have. And as always, we give the little girls the best place, and we put the boys there. So they're not happy with me, but they enjoy it. And uh, this is the face of it. That's a beautiful-looking building. But that's all we can have in the mountain. We continue with the picture. And that's the building. Um, uh, we make division inside of the storage so we can create rooms for the girls. And we have 66. It is not enough. Basically, it could only hold maybe 10, but we managed to fit 66 in it. And so we need a lot of prayers because that's the best we could do, as Pastor said. Two weeks before, we had to flee to the mountain, and we had no preparation, nothing. It is just take off, and we had to go. So that's the kitchen uh, that we have built. That's the kids, beautiful, with uniform. And so now they're going back to, to school in the mountain. And one thing that they have not lost, they have not lost their appetite. So we thank God for that. And that's a good thing. And uh, I want you to see this picture because before we used to have running water. Now we have to use a horse to go and get water from the river. And with all the consequences that may lead with all the GI infection and things. But uh, we thank God also for this 4x4. Four four. The horse is the wheel 4x4. Four four. And we, we give glory for God to God for that. And before the crisis uh, turned to the highest point, we used to order Cooligan water from, the, from downtown, and now we can't. So that's why we had to use the horses. That's the church, and uh, we, we used to have a building. Not, now we are washing under the mango tree. And let me tell you, it is really fun, okay? It's cool, it's open air, we don't have wall, and the kids are worshiping the Lord. The only thing when it is raining, we have to run. So, but that's part of being in the mountain. That's our kids, that's the church outside, and that's, uh, that's the kids doing their homework. And that is like a little dream because the horse can do so much, but uh, the mountain sometimes is rough. We, have, we don't have propane to cook, so we have to go and get wood. We have to go and get water. We have to go to the free market to buy food. And sometimes poor horses, it get tired. So we hope and pray to get an ATV to be able to negotiate the mountain to carry water, wood, and food, and whatever we can get. So we are praying that God will do something. That's Boaz, and he has obtained his license to drive a donkey. So he is the water boy, and uh, met poor guy, because to feed water to the orphanage, uh, 66, you can imagine how many trips you have to make. But I guess sometimes he's enjoying it because he likes riding the donkey. So that's a win-win for him. He'll bring water and having free ride. Um, 
before we get to the mountain, not only God has helped us to build a place, but we were able to plant a lot of trees, fruit trees. So we had a lot. You name it, we have it. We have plantain, we have potatoes, we have cherries, lemon, and everything that we could grow. We transformed this little piece of land into a paradise, and then all of a sudden we had to run. And leave all behind. And right now we are almost in a desert. And uh, having to face no running water, no electricity, no light, no food. And we are barely struggling. And the worst part of it, we don't know how long we are in the mountain. Because a few weeks ago we thought that it was bad. But based on what we uh, we, we see now it is even worse. So we go from bad to worse. But we do not lose faith. We know that God is able in the midst of the chaos, he will do something. But one thing that I know that I will not do, I will not quit on the children. I will continue to go and I will continue to serve them. I will continue to be a doctor for them when they need me and a brother, a father, and uh, I, I committed myself to do that. The reason I do that is because without someone like a missionary, without someone like you, I would not be alive today. And to even be able to preach the word of God. I grew up in an orphanage, abandoned by my father, never had a chance to go to school until 10 years old. And when I went to school, it was because of people like you sitting here, but thinking about children in Haiti. You send your love, your money, your finance. You actually go, and you gave me a chance to go to school. And by that, I met Jesus Christ. And by meeting Jesus Christ, he took care of me. How many of you know that Jesus is taking care of his children? No matter where they are. No matter where they are. And that's why we know the best help that a country can ever have is Jesus. The best help a country that could ever receive is receive the truth and let the truth set them free. So I thank God for that. And uh, continue to pray for me and uh, I will continue to pray for you. And maybe one day God will allow us to travel again uh, to Haiti if he doesn't come back yet and rapture us together. That's my hope. But meanwhile, while I'm waiting for the rapture, we will continue to serve the Lord together. Let us get to the word of God quickly. The first part, uh, I'm trying to shrink everything into a few minutes and uh, on top of this accent that you have to suffer and I hope you understand and as I said earlier I have to translate from French to English so whatever you hear me saying I translate it from French to English and that's the best accent you can have right now so just bear with me this morning I would like to share with your subject it is no matter how faithful you are as a Christian you will have to answer those three questions in your life have you been humble are you being tested and how is your heart? Have you been humble? Are you being tested and how is your heart? I hope you know that you are in a fight and you are constantly in the crosshair of the enemy, the adversary. You are in his scope and his ultimate goal is to bring you down at any cost and he's faithful at it. The Bible say that uh, the enemy in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, the enemy is like a roaring lion going all around to see whom he could devour. But he's a fake one. Because we know the real lion. The real lion is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is Jesus and he is our father and he is our shepherd. So I want you to be sure when you hear him, tell him that I know the real lion, Jesus Christ. But in the meantime, he knows you sometime better than you know yourself. He knows you sometime better than your parents, than your partners. He has made a study of you. He knows you in your weakest moment because that his ultimate goal is to tear you down. And to defeat you. He is a defeated and coward foe. 
He will take advantage of you when you are in your weakest moment. I mean, when you are stressed, when you are tired, when you feel lonely. He has certainly done that in my life. And I know that he has done that in your life. I just want to let you know, brothers and sisters, that as long that you are living on planet Earth, you will never reach a point where the enemy will say, oh, I just quit on him. He's fine. No, he will do it and he will continue to do it. Let me tell you something about him. He despises what you have learned to love. He hates everything you love. He hates the God that you are serving. And also, he hates the Jesus that you preach. And if he can possibly humiliate you, destroy you, embarrass you, he will do it with a heartbeat. And there will be a party in hell and all the demons will applaud him. Because he's, when you are distracted doing other things, the enemies constantly have you in his crosshair. Thank God, Jesus is with us. And he never abandoned us. Upon going to heaven, he said that I will send you the consolator. I will send you the comforter. The Holy Ghost will never leave you. And that's the only reason that you and I, we are alive together, is the presence of God around us. One of his favorite moments of attacks is doing stress and distraction and isolation. I would like to read for you in 2 Timothy 4, verse 9 and 18. You're going to hear a man. This is Apostle Paul. And uh, he is in jail. I'm talking about real jail. And uh, because the reason that I say that, I went to Montreal to visit a friend of mine. And I had to wait 30 minutes to wait for him. And then when he came, he, he has his towel on his shoulder. He was playing soccer while being in hell. And then waiting for him, I said, oh, what happened? Oh, I was playing soccer. I said, ha ha, that's good hell. But we're not talking about this hell. We're talking about the hell where Apostle Paul was. It was dark. It was cold. He was by himself. There was no soccer. And you can imagine that was a man with long beard, bruise, wrinkle, barefoot, cold. You know why I know that? Let us read the word together in 2 Timothy 4 verse 9. Now there is, a, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. But what you have not read is the seventh verse. Although in jail, Apostle Paul has already said that I have fight the fight. And I have won the race. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. But you and I would say, what are you talking about, Paul? You are in jail. And you know that you have already gone to the second verdict. That means Paul was condemned to be beheaded. So what are you talking about running the race? What are you talking about winning the race? Brothers and sisters, you cannot measure your success of what happened to you here. You measure your success according to the divine plan of God for your life. What happened to you here is just 80 years old, 70 for the strongest. But your success is measured by eternity that God has for you in store. And at the age of, the, of Paul, he was tired. And what was before him was a straight, unavoidable journey to a beheaded. Let me tell you, Paul, a righteous man, he, was, he has been declared righteous by God. But do you know who was the judge at that time, at that moment, when Paul was in jail? That was the meanest, the worst person that the world has ever seen. That was Nero. Could you imagine Apostle Paul, one of the righteous men, one of the noblemen, sitting at the judgment seat of Nero, a man who killed his best benefactor, his children, his wife, the man, the meanest one. But at that time, he was the judge, and Paul was the condemned. Let me tell you something. Sometimes you may say that life is not I want to confirm it to you. 
life is not fair. Amen? It is not. But Jesus, Jesus is fair. So don't come and complain and complain that life is not fair. In the prison, in the dark, the best man that the world has ever seen, he was waiting for a beheaded. But Apostle Paul was determined not to let the jail to determine the way he was. Inside of him, if you could be close to the jail, you would see, you would hear Apostle Paul singing. And you would hear this song from a distance. It is well. It is well with my soul. I hope you also can sing, it is well with your soul when you are in the jail of some circumstance and you know that you will not get out. And I'm saying that it's not because I want you to be sad. There are circumstances where you will, humanly speaking, you will not get out. You receive a diagnosis. That's why when I go praying for people, I don't, they are telling you, God is going to heal you. I said, you know, I'm praying for you that the best will of God can be done in your life. Because I don't know what he's going to do. Paul was not delivered from the jail. As a matter of fact, he was straight to a beheaded. But he had the joy in his life. And he has already said, I won the ways and I have the crown of justice. But... In this chapter, you're going to hear Paul saying a few things. Timothy, please come. In your darkest time, when you feel down, bring someone in your life. Like pastor said, do not abandon the flock. Because the predators, what they do, they isolate you to kill you. So when animals want to protect themselves, do you know what they do? They stay together. Because the last one that stay at the tail is already killed. So stay together with the flocks. Stay with your church. Stay in the reading of the word. Stay in prayer. Stay in communion. Because that's your strength. Together you are stronger. So stick together. Together. That's the first thing. So Paul, Paul will say, Timothy, please come. I need you. And he will continue to say that Demas has abandoned me. You will read the verse for yourself when you get home. And Tishukas, they have left and they go to Thessalonica. So you can say in the way that he's saying that he needed them. And he did not appreciate really that Demas abandoned him. And he said, but I have look with me. You will always have a look with you. In your down time, in your difficult time, God will raise a look in your life that you can call at 2 o'clock in the morning, that you can call at 1 o'clock, and he will answer. Pray that God put some look in your life. And then I was laughing when I was reading again when Apostle Paul said that, bring me Mark. Or John Mark. When you read back, they had a little discussion. It was not little. It was a harsh discussion. Because Mark was young. And during their mission time, Mark find it was too difficult. He abandoned the trip. Apostle Paul, Paul did not take it well. So he did not say a word. And then when they were going out again, and then John, John Mark came back to join them. And Paul said, oh no, you're not coming with me. And when I needed you, you abandoned me. Now you're not coming with me. And that was going to create a division between Barnabas and Paul. And if you know Barnabas and Paul, God has put them together. When the Holy Ghost said, put me aside, Paul and Barnabas. So, brothers and sisters, sometimes division will happen between two good people. And then you might be in a circumstance where one is right and the other one is not wrong that may happen okay so Barnabas went with uh, 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 John Mark put his arm around him and then Paul took Silas and they go but at his last days you're gonna see Paul will say something and that's why I laugh he said, please bring Timothy, eh, bring John Mark with me. Let me tell you, in your time of stress, could you please have mercy on somebody or someone who has abandoned you? 
Someone who has done something to hurt you. Someone who has disappointed you. And someone that you have said, I don't need you. Literally, Paul said to John Mark, I don't need you. I want to go on my own. But at his jail, he said, could you please bring John Mark? I need him. Do you have a John Mark in your life that uh, you have once said, I don't need you. I don't want to have anything to see with you. Could you at the end of the service, it can be a cousin, a friend, it can be a relative, it can be someone. Can you give John Mark a call and say that, I need you? It takes a broad shoulder for someone, for a Christian to call someone, especially if it's someone who has hurted you, if it's someone who, have, who has disappointed you, and you, you are right, you know, give John Mark a call and let him know. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, you are not alone. If the enemy knows that he is going to take advantage of you because you feel down, he was, he filled the, the and you're going to see in the chapter, he's going to say, oh, bring the coat because he was cold. He's going to say also, bring the watch that I have left because he was counting hours to get killed. By the way, Timothy did not have a chance to see Paul. Because he was already executed when Timothy arrived. You know, he needed to control time. When you are in your, min, in your downfall, be careful of your time. Be careful of people around you. Stay with Christ. Stay in the Lord. Stay in the reading. And then he's going to say, bring me the books. Especially the parchment. In your minutes time, don't go away from the Bible. In your stress time, stick to the word. If you cannot read it, hear it. If you cannot hear it, sing it. But keep tight with the word of God. Let me tell you, you will never, never be disappointed of Jesus Christ. Because he will never abandon you. He will never forsake you. He will always be with you. And to sum up all of that, take time to encourage one another, especially to encourage one that you have rejected and you thought that you were right. Remember, God forgive, forgive you once. Remember, if, you, if God was treating you the same way you are treating John Mark, you would probably never be God's friend anymore. But God has forgiven you. You can also forgive John Mark. It takes broad shoulder, especially when you feel like you are VIP, you are a pastor, you are a deacon, you are a big brother. And this little brother, you probably will never need him. Why should you get back and call him to give him uh, the, 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 the feeling that he is important? Every one of us is important. Amen? And you need one another. Let me tell you all this to say. And I would like to sum up that for you. All this to say, may you grow in grace. May you grow in truth. You have been forgiven once or maybe twice. And if you are me, you cannot remember how many times you have been forgiven. Why don't you forgive other people too? Why don't you give a chance to John Mark? May your life and your ministry be characterized as one who has gone out of your way to forgive someone, like Paul showed. This person, as little or wretched he could be, you may need him. You never know. So, my advice for you, stay close to a good friend. Stay close to a good friend and for long term. You need that. You may not, you may need more. May at least have a good friend that you can call. Get over the disappointment of someone who walked away from you. I'm telling you the bad news. He will not be the only one. People will walk away from you. People will abandon you. People will disappoint you. That's the nature of life. In the ministry, I cannot remember how many times people abandoned me. But God bring other people. So get over it. It will happen again. It will happen again. May you be big enough to encourage 
and embrace those who once fell, but who have recovered. John Mark has already recovered, but you still hold him down. Watch out for those also who may harm you. Watch out, because in the chapter, you're going to hear Apostle Paul say that there were a certain Alexander. Alexander the coppersmith in the dungeon, but Apostle Paul will, wrote, will write to Timothy and say, hmm, bring me John Mark, but pay attention to Alexander. He's a wicked man. Don't be naive neither. Because I'm not telling you that there is only Luke, there is only Mark, there is also Alexander, the coppersmith. He was wicked. And Apostle Paul said, stay away from him. There are people also, don't be naive, there are people to stay away. The Holy Ghost will tell you. By holding close to a friend... You will guard yourself against isolation. You surely don't want to be isolated in your time of stress. By getting over of those who disappointed you, you will guard yourself against bitterness. You need to guard yourself against bitterness. You need to call John Mark and give John Mark again a chance because he has already repented a long time ago. By putting your arm around those who have restored, who have been restored, you will also guard yourself against pride. There is no reason to be pride. You're not better than this brother. And if you watch for those who can harm you, you will also guard yourself against disillusion, disillusionment. Because don't be naive. Some people will hurt you, and they will hurt you again. They will hurt you again, and God wants you to be wise. So there is Jean-Marc. There is Luke. These people, you need them. Brothers and sisters, in time of stress, God may say, I am with you, but it's not just saying. He is with you. And the word, sometimes we operate with, with different dictionary with God. We think delivery or deliver means get you out of the thing, but deliver in God Vocabulary may say that I'll go through it with you. You will die, but you will come to me. Paul, I will deliver you. But Paul would say to Jesus, what? That means they will not cut my head anymore? And Jesus would say, no, Paul, they will. But you will be delivered. What? Let me tell you something. In the situation that you are, God has a different definition for deliver for you. He will be with you. You might go. You might die. You might be delivered. I don't know what he will do. But remember, because he is with you, you cannot be defeated. Because he is with you. Apostle Paul has already declared his victory in verse 7 when he said that, I won the race, I fight the fight, and I am victorious. And he's going to get killed. Is there a contrast? Yes. There is no contrast. I want you to know. God has delivered him. So brothers and sisters, it is time of stress, but have Jesus with you. It is time of stress. Hold on to the reading. It is time of stress. Hold on to the singing. Continue to sing. It is well with my soul. It is not about what you feel. It is what about God has put into your heart. You are delivered. God is with you. You will never be abandoned by, by God. And that's why I refuse to see Haiti with the same eyes that everybody will see it. I will be delivered. As a matter of fact, I am delivered. Because God is in control. May God be with you. And if you don't know this Christ, please. It is about time to be his friend. May God bless you.